Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lecture series for college algebra. This is section 2.4 and it deals with circles. The first thing we're going to consider is the point HK, where this is just some x value and some y value at this point, and some arbitrary other point xy. Now, they lie r units away from one another. So let's use the distance formula as we had seen in previous videos. If we have the distance formula, I'm going to take the square root of my changes in x plus my changes in y, and these units are squared. This is going to equal, in this case, r, because the distance between these points. And we're calling it r. So what is my change in x? Well, I have this x value minus this x value, this y value here minus this y value. Now, to eliminate this square root, I'm just going to square both sides. And if I square both sides, the square root goes away. This is the equation of a circle. A circle is defined as all the points in a plane that are r units away from the center. So hk actually describes the center of a circle. And if I go r units away here, or r units away here, or here, or here, or all the way around, we actually see that we're actually making a circle from this radius. And I'll just continue it all the way around. Hopefully my freehand circle doesn't look too bad. But what this describes is a circle, any point on here. Now, hopefully we realize that the equation of a circle is actually very similar to the distance formula. And as we had seen in previous videos, the distance formula is a variation of Pythagorean theorem. And I hope this doesn't uh, blow your mind too much. But circles and triangles, at least right triangles, are actually described using the same equation. Because essentially what we're looking at is any change in x and change in y. That describes a triangle. What if my arbitrary xy point was up here? Well, I'd go x units this way, y units that way, and this is always r. It's a different triangle. So if we have an infinite number of triangles, it's described using this equation, which looks very similar to Pythagorean theorem. Now, one other thing we want to define is this right here. If we have a circle that's centered at the origin, where my h is 0 and k is 0, minus 0, minus 0 in those values, we get what's called the unit circle if the radius is 1. And the unit circle looks just like that. The unit circle is centered at the origin. h and k, in this case, are 0. And r is 1. Now, when it comes to de determining what h and k is, always keep in mind that it's minus the h value and minus the k value. When they're in this grouping symbol before it's squared, you're always going to see the opposite value you're looking for within that symbol. Let's actually look at an example of a circle. If we come over here, we're asked to graph this circle. And this circle is in standard form, just as we've seen over here, x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals the radius squared. So our center is the hk value. Well, let's determine what h and k are. Well, what am I subtracting from x before I square it? Well, there's nothing being subtracted. So h, in this case, is 0. What am I subtracting from y before I square it? Well, here, as I said before, notice it's the opposite of what I see in there, because it's y minus the k value. Well, y minus a negative 3 would give me y plus 3. So k, in this case, would be a negative 3. So that's how we determine the circle when it's written in standard form. We just say, what am I subtracting from x? What am I subtracting from y? It's always going to be the opposite of what I actually see in there. Now, the radius, we look at this value right here, what it's set equal to. Well, the radius, this is the radius squared. So the radius, I'd have to take the square root of that. Now, when we introduce square roots, we think plus or minus. But because the radius is defined as a distance, 
we only have to worry about its absolute value. It's going to be 2. So the square root of 4 is 2. Well, let's find some additional information. We know how to find x-intercepts. We just set the y value to 0. If this is 0, 3 squared is 9. Subtract 9 from both sides. And I get, I'm going to write it right here, x squared equals negative 5. And that's just setting y to 0 and getting my constants to the other side. Now, to solve this, I take the square root of both sides. Well, I realize right now, if I take the square root of both sides, I'm taking the square root of a negative number. That's not a real value. That's an imaginary value. That tells me something about the x-intercepts. That means there are no x-intercepts. So when it comes to graphing it, I'm going to realize that it will not cross the x-intercept or the x-axis because there are no x-intercepts. Let's find the y-intercept. Well, we take the equation and we set x equal to 0. Well, this we have a perfect square equal to 4. We can use the square root method. So if I do the square root method, I'll write it right here. y plus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 4 is 2. <clears throat> And now I can just subtract 3 for both sides. y equals negative 3 plus or minus 2. Well, that's actually two separate values, negative 3 plus 2 and negative 3 minus 2, which tells me I have two y-intercepts. In this case, negative 3 minus 2. When x was 0, I get negative 5. And when x is 0, negative 3 plus 2, negative 1. Two y-intercepts, no x-intercepts. Now, with all this information, the center, the radius, <coughs> any intercepts that exist, I can go to my graph and graph it. Now, I said this is important because when I graph it, it better not cross the x-axis. So let's first start with our center. Our center is 0, negative 3, so x is 0, and our y value is negative 3. And I know from this center, I can go 2 in any direction. Maybe I go. 2 to the right, 1, 2. 2 to the left, 1, 2. 2 up and 2 down. And if we notice, what were my y-intercepts? 0, negative 5, well, that's 2 up from this value. Or excuse me, 0, negative 1, that's 2 up from this value. And the 0, negative 5 is 2 down from this value. And now with enough points there, I see I have four points. Well, that should be enough to graph the circle. And even though it's free-handed, it looks relatively circle-ish. It should be a circle. All right, <clears throat> what happens if our circles are not in standard form? Sometimes we'll see circles written in general form. Well, let's just take for a moment and expand what we just had here. x squared plus y plus 3 squared equals 4. What we're going to do is we're going to expand this to put it into general form so we can see that they are very similar. Uh, well, they're actually the same, just a different way of looking at it. Well, x squared is what it is. And this, I can use FOIL to, square, to FOIL it out. I'm going to get y squared plus 6y plus 9 equals to 4. And in general form, notice it's set equal to 0. Well, let me just subtract 4 from both sides. And now it's in general form. So we can see, yes, we have an x squared term. We have a y squared term. ax, well, we don't have an ax term. Well, that's because our a coefficient is actually 0. 0 times x, there's not going to be an x there. But we do have our by, and we do have a constant of 5. Now notice this is not the same as that radius. All right, so let's graph an equation in general form. Well, in order to graph this, I want to have it in standard form. I want to have it in the quantity x plus, or x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals to the radius squared. So in order to do that, we're going to have to do something called completing the square. We've reviewed completing the square in a previous video, so hopefully we remember how to complete the square. In order to do it on a circle, essentially what we have to do is we don't just do it once, we do it twice. And we start out by grouping our variables together. x squared, and then we have a minus 6x. So I group those together, and I'm going to leave a space here, because if we recall, when we complete the square, we're going to add a coefficient to make this a perfect square. 
And then I'm going to have my y squared and my 2y. And I'm going to leave a space. And then if this had a constant, I would just move it across the equal sign. But in this case, there is no constant like this that I, to move over. I'm essentially moving 0. Now we can complete the square. And hopefully we remember how to do that. We take half of this quantity and square it. Well, half of negative 6 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is a positive 9. What you do to one side of an equation, you must always do to the other. Don't forget that. That's a common mistake that students do when using completing the square. Now, we completed the square here, but we also have to do it here. Well, half of 2 is 1, and 1 squared is 1. I added 1 to this side of the equation. I have to remember to add 1 to that side of the equation. Now we're ready to do a little bit of factoring, and we're, we'll have the equation in standard form. Well, this is a perfect square. It factors to x and half of b, in this case, x minus 3. Plus, this is now a perfect square of y and half of b, which was a positive 1, equals to 9 plus, or 0 plus 9 plus 1, which is 10. If we see it is now in standard form, I can now determine what the center is, what the radius is, uh, and I can find any x-intercepts or y-intercepts. So let's go ahead and do that, because this did ask us to graph this equation. So we put it in standard form. We're ready to graph it. So I'm just going to move over here. Looking at this equation, my hk is always the opposite of what I see in here. So instead of negative 3, it's positive 3. Here I have y plus 1, so I want negative 1, the opposite of what I see in there. And that is the center. Then we look at the radius. Well, the radius is always the square root of this value. Well, the square root of 10, well, it's not a nice number. It's an irrational number. So let's just leave it as a square root of 10. Let's find some x-intercepts. Well, looking at this equation, hopefully the camera is following here. The x-intercept, well, we know how to find an x-intercept. We set y to 0. So I have 1 squared is 1. I can subtract 1 from both sides. So I get x minus 3 quantity squared equals 9. Well, that's nice. It's a perfect square. So I can use the square root method and get x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 9, which is 3. So 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 minus 3 is 0. 6 and 0 are my x-intercepts. So 0 when y was 0 and 6 when y was 0, two different intercepts. Let's find any y-intercepts. Well, that's just setting x to 0. So if this is 0, negative 3 squared is 9. Subtract 9 from both sides, and I'll just write the equation over here. y plus 1 squared equals 1. And what I can do here is I can use the square root method and subtract 1. Negative 1 plus or minus 1. Well, the values I get here, negative 1 plus 1, is 0, and negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So I have two values. I have when x is 0, I got negative 2. And when x was 0, I also got 0. Well, this is actually good information. This tells me something important. x-intercept of 0, 0 is the same as the y-intercept of 0, 0. Well, this is the origin. That's where x and y actually share the same intercept. All right, so let's take all this information and put it on our graph. All right, we know the center is 3, negative 1. So I'm going to go 3 in the x direction and down 1 in the y. And I'm going to label my center 3, negative 1. Now the radius, I'm going to go square root of 10 units in all directions from that. Well, the square root of 10, it's not a pretty number. I know it's a little bit more than 3, because the square root of 9 would be 3, and this is more than 9. But we'll hold off on that. Look, we have these three points to graph. So that'll give us some idea. And hopefully, we'll see the pattern be able, yep, I can draw a circle with that given information. Well, 0, 0, that is an x and y intercept. I have 6, 0. So if I go over here, six, uh, 6 units. And then I have 0, negative 2. So 0, negative 2 
And we can see that this is going to be the square root of 10 units away. And hopefully that's enough that we can say, all right, well, let's sketch the circle. And when we're freehanding circles, it's not always the easiest thing to do. But we get the idea it is kind of circle-ish, right? Or maybe you'd want to use a protractor or something like that. Us super nerds have protractors. We could then sketch that, and it would actually pass through those points and give us all the rest as well. All right. So here is your quiz. I want you to try it for yourself. Given this equation in general form, x squared plus y squared minus 4x equals 0, write this equation in standard form. Identify the center, h and k. Give the radius, any x or y intercepts, and then use that information to graph the equation. All right, let's move on to using graphing utilities. At the college algebra level, you'll use graphing calculator a lot more often than you would uh, in any other class that may have came before this. So you have to know how to use your calculator. Now, some of you may know how to graph something like this, this circle, in a calculator by changing settings. But to graph this in your most basic of graphing calculators, in order to do that, you have to set this equal to y. Now, to solve this for y, essentially what I'd have to do is subtract x squared from both sides. So y squared equals negative x squared and this positive 9. So I just move the x squared term across the equal sign. Now, to solve this for y, I've got to take the square root. Now, when I introduce a square root, I always remember it could be plus or minus whatever I'm taking the square root of. Now, our calculator, our standard calculators, aren't going to accept plus or minus. In order to graph this, when you go to your graphing utility, you're going to have to put in the equation twice. y equals the positive x squared plus 9, because we do have a domain restriction here, right? And y equals the negative. So in our calculator, we have the opportunity to put in y1 or y2, the negative of our negative x squared plus 9. Now, if you put this into your standard graphing utility, you will see this value when you graph it, because it is centered at the origin, so we know that's our center. You're going to have a radius of 3. You're going to see something like this when this section of the graph uh, is put in. On the other side, you're going to have to put in the negative, and you'll see the bottom half of the tri or a circle, excuse me. So that's why you have plus or minus. Now, in some more advanced graphing utilities, you may know how to set the parameters so that you can do something like this. Okay. Otherwise, you solve it for y and you put it in each piece. This is the top half of our circle. This is the bottom half of our circle. So why don't you take out your calculator and try that and see that you can actually graph this. All right. So this has been section 2.4 for college algebra dealing with circles. Thank you for watching.